Okay. So thank you all for joining us for the Archaeological Society of Connecticut and the Friends of the Office of State Archaeology's winter lecture series. Uh, we are pleased to have Megan Willison uh, today to speak about settlement and trade in 17th century Connecticut. Megan is a doctoral candidate at the University of Connecticut, and she is a staff archaeologist at the National Park Service uh, at Dinosaur National Monument. So that's uh, pretty nice. Uh, to be working at a dinosaur park when you're an archaeologist. People usually get those two things confused. Um, let's see, while at UConn, Megan received a master's degree in 2016 and was also the recipient of numerous awards, including the FOSA Cook Scholarship and the Fields of Conflict Poster Award. She was also an intern at the National Park's American Battlefield Protection Program while a student at UConn. As I said today, I think she'll be speaking with us uh, about her dissertation research settlement and trade in 17th century Connecticut. And we are very pleased uh, to have her kick off our winter lecture series. So with that, I'm going to mute myself and stop my video and take it away. Hi, everybody. I'm going to assume that you can hear me unless I start getting a lot of notifications otherwise. Thank you, Dave, for the introduction. And thank you to FOSA and the ASC for inviting me to speak today about my dissertation research. I want to apologize. I put spring lecture series instead of winter, so just ignore that on my uh, front screen right there. So today I will be talking about settlement and trade in 17th century Connecticut, but it is going to be a little bit more focused on the Pequot, specifically in southern Connecticut in the early 17th century, so indigenous state trade and settlement patterns. M Megan, uh, real quick, sorry, yeah. I just meant to also mention, sorry, this is the first one that we've done, so I, I need to get back into Zoom uh, mindset. If you have any questions, please either write them down during the talk or mention them in our Q&A or chat feature, and we will, uh, e either I or someone else will MC these questions to Megan uh, after she's finished her presentation. So we will have time for a Q&A session, but only after her talk. Uh, so please either enter them into the chat or the Q&A and Megan will uh, get to them at the end of the talk. Great, thanks. Thank you. Um, and I also wanted to say I'm excited for the rest of the lecture series of other current and former UConn graduate students who will also be presenting their research. So make sure you're tuning in for those as well. So to start off, um, a little overview of what I'll be talking about. First, I'm going to give a very, very brief overview of this time period and some of the uh, political powers at play, but I'm only going to spend like two minutes on that. So it's going to be like this very brief spark notes version. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about the Pequot War, which was an important war during this time period in this region. But it was, it was also because of studying this war that we were able to find the domestic sites that I've been focusing my dissertation on. And then lastly, I'll look at the sites I've been excavating for the past couple of years. And yes, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and I look forward to answering them at the end. And of course, I'm starting off with a technical, there we go, next slide, perfect. Uh, so one quick thing I wanna note is I am going to be showing four maps that were published in the 17th century. And if you really like historic maps like I do, um, you should go, because you're on your computer, you should go to Yukon's library. They have a MAGIC, that's an acronym, M-A-G-I-C. Their webpage, you can find all kinds of historic maps, not only the ones in this presentation, but also from whatever town you're living in. If you're living in Connecticut, you can check them out. So if you get nothing else from this talk, you know where to find some really cool historic maps. This one was by Robert Morden in 1676. And I wanted to show this one first because um, again, not only do I like historic maps, but I think it does an interesting job or a nice job of showing the different uh, political groups that start to develop during this time period. So the 17th century was during the age of exploration or the age of discovery, which you might have heard before in your middle school or high school history class. That started in the 15th century and lasted through the 17th. And it was a period of time when European powers, particularly those that were seafaring, started exploring other parts of the world to extract resources, to convert individuals to Christianity, and for adventure um, and wealth that could be gained through those opportunities. 
We start to see this happening along New England in the 15th and 16th centuries with such expeditions as Verrazano in 1524 and Cartier in 1534. It isn't until the 17th century though that we start to see more intense settlement happening. Particularly, um, the Dutch start to arrive in the region in 1611. Plymouth Colony or the Pilgrims established their settlement in 1620. The Massachusetts Bay Colony is established in 1629. Uh, and in Connecticut itself, we start to have settlers coming into the region in between 1633 and 1635. And then in March of 1636, the Connecticut Colony is granted their charter. Here's another fun map. This one, you have to do a little bit of exercising and turn your head to the right. I'm not sure why it's oriented like that, but if you uh, turn your head this way, I probably look like a goof right now. Uh, on the left is the coast of Connecticut. And this map was made by William Hubbard. It's believed to be published in 1677. And you can see towards the top, some, of, some towns that might be familiar to you like Hartford. So a lot of people were settling in this area and trade was a really important activity. And some of the common trade items that were being exchanged at this time were kettles, duffel cloth, jaw harps, glass beads, axes, hoes, spoons, looking glasses, and a variety of other items. The one particular group that I'm going to be speaking about are the Pequot who are located in Southern Connecticut. And if you're from Connecticut, or even if you're not, if you're from the region, you might have heard of the Pequot before, um, uh, like the Mashantucket Pequot. And on this map, they're located towards the middle left. This next map does a, a little bit of better job and you don't have to turn your neck to see where the Pequot are located. This map was created, believed to be created in 1625 by an individual named Hayden. The Pequot in the early 17th century inhabited an area of roughly 250 square miles in Southeastern Connecticut bounded by the Thames and Pocatuck Rivers, Long Island Sound, and southern parts of present-day Preston and Griswold, Connecticut. There are presumed to have been about 8,000 Pequot individuals in the early 17th century, although there was a major epidemic that swept through the area um, in 1633 to 1634 that's believed to have reduced the population to about half their original size. Although their official territory, as you can see in this map, was located in Southern Connecticut, by the 1620s and 1630s, the Pequot exerted influence over various sachems and sachemships in Connecticut, Long Island, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island. And they're noted as being one of the five principal nations in New England. So they had a huge network. They exerted a lot of influence. The Dutch arrival in 1611, in addition in in addition to the flourishing fur and wampum trade in the 1620s and 1630s, led the Pequot by 1635 to control a region-wide network of tributary tribes and oversee trade in the region. Wampum, if you haven't heard of that term before or aren't as familiar with it, is a type of shell bead made from whelk or quahog. It comes in um, or it could be made into white and purple beads. It was used for a lot of purposes, such as for uh, as a means of exchange for recording treaties as a way of recording histories as well, forging alliances, ceremonial gift giving. And there was even a period of time when Europeans, uh, the English ran out of their own coin and used wampum as a form of currency. Wampum, particularly from Eastern Long Island, was a really important component of the fur trade and was in great demand by uh, tribes in the fur rich interior areas in the upper Connecticut and Hudson River drainages. So the coastal tribes had a monopoly on the wampum trade, which uh, the English or Dutch would be the middlemen to then trade that to the interior tribes to get the fur for those really lovely beaver hats that everyone wanted. The Dutch referred to wampum as the source and mother of the beaver trade and identified Long Island Sound as the mint of production. McBride and other researchers, Kevin McBride, has noted by the mid 1620s, it's estimated that 150,000 to 200,000 wampum beads were acquired yearly by the Dutch for the Northern fur trade. That's a lot of beads. So I originally said that the Pequot inhabited an area of roughly 250 square miles, but by 1631, they had controlled an area of 2,500 square miles, stretching 75 miles up the Connecticut Long Island coastlines and 50 miles up the Connecticut River. 
Oh, here's another pretty map to keep you uh, interested and engaged. This one was by Nicholas Vischer in 1685. It's a Dutch map of New England. And this one, you can see a little bit more detail of some of the, the tribes and different uh, people that were inhabiting this area. And the Pequot are in this yellow area right here. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but I'm just gonna keep circling it like you can. So the Pequot, they had a lot of power at this time. And with the Dutch, they had uh, control or exerted a lot of control over this fur and wampum trade, which was really an economic driving force in this area and was really important to a lot of different people. Some people, like the English and the Massachusetts Bay Colony, wanted to break up that trade network between the Pequot and the Dutch and uh, get in on that action to try and get some money out of this as well. So tensions, um, miscommunication, uh, divisions related to this wampum trade really started to broil and come to a head in the 1630s and that eventually culminated in the Pequot War which lasted from 1636 to 1637. This was the first war waged in northeastern North America between English colonists and Native Americans and it eventually ended with the complete displacement of surviving Pequot members with many sold into servitude both in Bermuda and into English homes. So the Pequot War trade was a big reason as to control of these trade network was a major reason as to why it erupted. Uh, another common reason as to why this war came about was as a result of the murder of two English traders. And murder, I know it sounds really uh, intrigue, and it was intriguing at the time. Uh, there were two gentlemen, John Stone and John Oldham, uh, John Stone was murdered in 1634, and then John Oldham was murdered in 1636. They're both traitors. Eventually, this second murder kind of pushed the English over the edge in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, and Endicott, uh, an English military man, uh, went to Lock Island and then to the Thames River, to the Pequot, to exact revenge for this murder and to ask for the murderers to be turned in. And this was kind of the first official skirmish that started off the Pequot War, which eventually turned into uh, various other skirmishes. Now, this was not the first time that the Pequot had battled a European entity. There was a war in 1634 between the Dutch and the Pequot, although very little is known about it or has been reported about it. Um, one thing that we do know, though, is that as a result of this Dutch Pequot War two years earlier in 1634, the Pequot were able to learn typical European styles of fighting. And as a result, in the first few months of the Pequot War, they tried to avoid open battle as much as possible and were very successful. They won every skirmish through their tactics of ambush um, and kind of catching them by surprise, the English. Eventually, though, um, there was a, a turn in the, in the war. Um, there was a raid on the town of Weathersfield where the Pequot uh, murdered men, women, and took two girls captive. And it was as a result of that action that the Connecticut colony first declared war on May 1st, 1637. And they started to mobilize for what would be the attack on Mystic Fort. And here is an image of the various battles related to the Pequot War. And the one I'm going to talk about now is this uh, battle at Mystic Fort, also known as the Massacre at Mystic Fort, uh, the Mystic Massacre, which occurred on May 26, 1637. This event that occurred in the early morning uh, took the lives of hundreds of Pequot men, women, and children. This is a woodcut of the event where Captain Underhill and uh, Mason surrounded the fort with their Narragansett and Mohegan allies. Eventually, when it was becoming challenging to enter the fort and do what they wanted inside the fort, they set the fort ablaze and very quickly a, a lot of Pequot individuals died. But immediately following the massacre, the English retreated back to their ships, which were about six miles away, and, or the retreat route was about six miles away, and were pursued by Pequot men who mobilized from surrounding villages when they saw what was happening. Fighting was continuous along roughly six miles of this retreat route and resulted in the loss, breakage, and discard of hundreds of metallic 
weapons, uh, utilitarian objects, and personal items. As part of an effort to document the Pequot War and the battlefields of the Pequot War, including this retreat route, which would later be called the Battle of the English Withdrawal, Kevin McBride and researchers from the Mashantucket Pequot Museum and Research Center applied for and were awarded seven grants from the National Park Service American Battlefield Protection Program. Three of these seven grants were specifically used to study battlefields related to the Mystic Massacre and to this Battle of the English Withdrawal or the retreat route. With the aid of these grants, in addition to the support of local landowners, uh, local metal detectorists, community members, University of Connecticut undergraduate and graduate students, and our field school students from across the country, uh, two and a half miles out of the total six and a half mile retreat route have been investigated to date. And this map that I have up here shows the retreat route and in blue are not the domestic sites, but overall site types that we were denoting from all of the artifacts that were being recovered and in gray are areas that haven't been investigated. One unanticipated discovery that resulted from studying the location, artifacts, and narratives of the Battle of the English Withdrawal was the uncovering of six possible indigenous domestic sites. These sites represent the largest assemblage of early 17th century native archeological sites associated with a single indigenous group ever identified in Southern New England and contain an amount and diversity of English and Dutch trade items that is unprecedented in the archeology span of contact period sites other than in native cemeteries. So we were finding a lot of stuff as a result of this project. The sites are believed to be dated based upon their material signature to between 1611 or the arrival of the Dutch in the area and 1637, the conclusion of the Pequot War. We have this end date as the Pequot War because after the war, the Pequot were labeled extinct and forcibly removed from their traditional homelands. They were only later in 1651 granted permission by, colonial by the colonial government to settle on a reservation several miles uh, southeast from the sites in this current map. The sites are not believed to date to this later post-1651 era due to the ceramic typologies and some of the other artifacts that we found. For ceramic typologies in this later post-1651 era, we start to see a ceramic type called Shantok where emerge, which we don't see at any of the archaeological sites um, that I've been studying. So how were these sites found? And in this map, the green circles, which I realize there's quite a bit of green in this image, uh, but the green circles within the larger gray circle denote areas of possible domestic sites. The six early 17th century Pequot domestic sites were located through a combined use of metal detecting and traditional archeological surveying, such as through shovel test pits that are 50 centimeter by 50 centimeter squares dug at a predefined interval uh, could be every five meters, every 10 meters, every 15 meters. But basically you're digging a hole instead of using a metal detector. Before going into the field to start doing this surveying, researchers at the Pequot Museum read primary accounts, battle narratives, and battlefield archaeology, battlefield archaeology literature to understand the length, duration, and general course of the retreat route following the burning of Mystic Fort. Utilizing existing conflict, conflict and I can't speak today, conflict and battlefield archaeology techniques, metal detectorists from the Yankee Territory coin shooters and archaeologists with the Pequot Museum began surveying the English retreat route. Metal detecting was the chosen methodology over traditional archaeological surveying to start off because most of the battlefield weaponry and European armor from this time era were made of metal and metal detecting appeared to be the most expedient and cost effective method for determining the size, location and direction of this retreat route. And they were very successful once you see all the artifacts that were found through metal detecting. So far, this has resulted in the recovery of 3,354 metallic artifacts from the battlefield of which 893 or almost 900 um, which also is 27% of the total, are definitively dated to the 17th century. And there are quite a few more that we think are probably 17th century, but we know at least a little more than a quarter are definitely related to the time period of interest. Uh, of the 17th century metallic objects, it should be noted 
that our metal detector collaborators, and specifically two of them who my advisor Kevin McBride has dubbed the Jedi Masters of Metal Detecting, have collectively found 75% of our 17th century metallic objects. So we're very thankful for them uh, because they have found the majority of uh, what we're looking for. In 2013, the first domestic site, Site 5973 or Kaluna Hill, was discovered when archaeologists located two middens associated with various metallic objects, including high, portion, high proportions of scrap brass and iron. Upon further excavation analysis, it became apparent that some of the metallic assemblage recovered from the Battle of the English Withdrawal was associated with the domestic sites and not the battle itself. For example, while originally indigenous and European personal and trade items such as cuprous scrap, cuprous clasps and pins, cuprous beads, cuprous kettle fragments, axes, adds, iron tools like spoons and scissors and nails were assumed to be part of the battlefield assemblage. Later analysis following the discovery of this first domestic site demonstrated that when certain battle related artifacts like weaponry and musket balls were removed from GIS maps, these aforementioned personal and trade artifact classes appeared in distinct clusters. So here's an example of that. On the left, uh, all those black dots are all of the 17th century metals. But if you look on the right, the clusters are where we started to see what we thought are, were just uh, domestic types of artifacts, like again, spoons and cuprous scrap and things of that nature, not musket balls. Investigations through 50 centimeter by 50 centimeter shovel test pits and one meter by one meter excavation procedures at two additional sites, sites 5991 and 59111, containing these distinctive clusters has found that these artifacts are in close proximity to other non-metallic objects commonly associated with indigenous domestic sites, like indigenous ceramics, calcine bone, which calcine means it's burned at a really high temperature, so it turns like a whitish bluish color, Glass bottles, glass tray beads, which those are my favorite. I'm going to show you a picture of one and it's going to be beautiful. Uh, shell, charred botanical remains, and kaolin and steatite pipes. At least three other potential domestic sites exhibit these metallic domestic signatures, but further testing is needed to confirm that non metallic domestic artifacts are associated with them. So for this map that I've had up for a couple minutes or a minute or so, you can see the distribution of battle-related artifacts, such as projectile points, which are made out of copper, although we do have some that are made of iron, but the vast majority are made out of copper, like cut up copper kettles that indigenous groups were using. And Kevin McBride has been studying them and posits that based on their typology and what they look like, um, you can determine the tribe that the individual came from that fired it because certain tribes have a different uh, projectile point style than others, and the musket balls. And here are the uh, domestic artifacts, which on the next slide, they're circled by um, site. So the ones that you see on here, 5973, 5991, and 59111 are ones that I have been studying. 59, uh, 123 is one of the ones that we haven't done as much excavation at. So we don't have as much data for that one. These are some of the domestic artifacts that we found and associated with associated with non-metallic artifacts. So we're considering these to be types of artifacts that if you find them, it's possible that you might have an indigenous domestic site related to them. So copper kettle fragments, iron tools, nails. The lower left object, if you're trying to figure out what those are, those are all pieces of uh, Cooper scrap. We have a bead right here, number uh, inventory number 421. And over here we have a cut up hoe and pot hook in some adzes. And those again were associated with these types of artifacts, ceramics, um, we have some indigenous pottery. There's a steel type pipe right there, number inventory number 507 and 508. And in the lower left, these are the kaolin pipe fragments. So in addition to seeing clusters and being able to determine that certain metallic objects are more likely to be associated with a domestic site, 
we also were able to find that there were clusters of objects that appear solely related to the battle as they were not near any identified domestic clusters. For certain groupings, this seems a little bit intuitive like musket balls and Cooper's projectile points, although we found those near domestic sites as well. But what also appeared according to McBride are that certain native personal objects such as iron, brass and lead amulets which we're considering amulets to be some of these objects in the bottom center that have holes punctured through them that uh, someone could wear around their neck or somewhere else on their person. A Dutch brass bracelet, Jesuit rings, which are in the top right, graphite for uh, black paint and a brass comb were not found associated with any domestic site, suggesting that these items were used by indigenous combatants on the battlefield. Additionally, some metallic trade objects such as iron hose appear to have been stashed as possible plunder during the battle as they were not near any domestic context and do not show any evidence of reprocessing or reworking. This is in contrast to cuprous and ferrous metals found near or within domestic sites, where at least a quarter of all recovered 17th century metals in those domestic sites show evidence of reuse or manipulation. At 5973, 52% of metals have been reworked or reprocessed in some way, and at 59111 and 5991, a little over a quarter of all of those metallic artifacts have been reprocessed. Of all iron artifacts found from domestic context, 63% of them show evidence of reprocessing. So that's another indicator of a, what we're taking as another indicator of a domestic site activity is reprocessing these trade objects during the 17th century. So now I'm going to transition to talking a little bit more about the domestic sites I've been spending the few past few summers excavating and some of you out there might have been out there in the dirt with me so they'll, they'll be familiar to you. So these are the three I'll be talking about again 5973, 59111 and 5991. The first one, site 5973, was first discovered in 2013 and is hypothesized to be the location of several wigwams burned by the English during the retreat after the Mystic Massacre on May 26, 1637, as described in John Mason's A Brief History of the Pequot War. Within John Mason's account, he had the following passage that was, or that said, there was at the foot of the hill a small brook where we rested and refreshed ourselves, having by that time taught them a little more manners than to disturb us. We then marched on towards Pequot Harbor and falling upon several wigwams, burnt them. And we believe that this to be the location described in Mason's account. The distribution of battle and domestic related artifacts, including the direction of fire of a number of musket balls, in addition to burned features of the site and the aforementioned historical account, cumulatively suggests that standing structures existed at this site at the time of the English withdrawal, and that this particular site was occupied or abandoned shortly beforehand. Excavations and surveys at 5973 have occurred again since 2013, exposing approximately 81 square meters of archaeological deposits. Additionally, 60 shovel test pits have been excavated at five meter intervals across the site. For this site, as with the two others, excavations were carried out in one meter by one meter units, which were further excavated in 50 centimeter by 50 centimeter quads to increase locational accuracy of recovered remains. Horizontally, excavations proceeded in five centimeter arbitrary levels or a change until a change in the soil strata. All soils, once they were determined to be the location of domestic sites, were screened through eight, in, eight inch mesh, uh, which Funny story about that, at the other site, 5911, that I'll talk about in a minute, um, eighth inch mesh, um, when you have a lot of dirt, it can take a while to, to get through, as I'm sure many of you know. We had the field school students using this finer mesh at that site, and they were slogging through it, and they, I think, hated me because I was making them screen through this and not the bigger mesh aperture that would make the dirt go through a lot quicker. And they hadn't been finding anything for like two weeks now and they were getting super sad. So we decided that we were gonna switch up gears a little bit and change to the fourth inch mesh to just make everything go a little bit quicker and see if we were digging in the wrong area or what was going on. So I told the students, 
In an hour, once you all finish the buckets that you're working on, we'll switch the different meshes. Um, and within half an hour of that, like right before they were gonna switch and they were like all getting excited that they were gonna get to work with a different screen type, uh, one of our students found a trade bead, which was amazing, but the trade beads are super small. So if we had switched the mesh any sooner, we wouldn't have found it. So from that point on, they were not allowed to use any other mesh type but the eighth inch. They were a little upset about it, um, but anyway, that's why we used eighth inch mesh, all of them, because you wouldn't have found the trade beads otherwise. So back to this, uh, back to this site. At 5973, metal detecting aided in locating the middens, but shovel test pits resulted in an inconclusive survey with no period artifacts found. So at this site, as with some of the others, we were doing metal detecting, combining it with this traditional surveying technique, but the traditional surveying technique wasn't giving us anywhere near the results or really any results related to the 17th century. We were finding that primarily, if not wholly, through metal detecting. So one other, I guess, takeaway from this project was that because these sites are so dispersed and they have a pretty distinct and large metallic signature, at least at these sites, um, if you're trying to find another early 17th century trading site, I would highly recommend using metal detecting before or in conjunction with traditional surveying techniques because those traditional techniques didn't help us too much in this case. To further figure out where we we're supposed to dig at this site, uh, chemical phosphate testing was chosen. In chemical phosphate testing, the soil is tested for phosphates and high levels of phosphate are used as indicators of anthropogenic activity. And that helped delineate further areas to start excavating. So in this image on the left, this shows where the chemical phosphate testing was, um, with the red indicating really high levels of phosphate, which the blue outlines are where excavation occurred. So we tried to dig near those areas where we thought there might be middens or, or other things going on. Fieldwork at 5973 has exposed at least 22 features, including multiple post hole features showing at least one known wigwam structure or some other type of structure, and two middens with high densities of scrap iron and brass located within and adjacent to the midden. The excavations have resulted in the recovery of metallic artifacts, native and European ceramics, five glass trade beads, which using the kid and kid typology date to between 1600 and 1625, and faunal and botanical remains. If you listen to the fall lecture series, uh, Dr. William Farley gave a presentation um, and his work, his dissertation work was in, uh, in part at this site. So some of these images are from his dissertation. And the one on the left you can see is the possible uh, post hole delineation. We expanded a bit on this main excavation block, as you can see here, and we found a few more features in line with the uh, previously proposed outline to show where the wigwam or some type of structure is continuing. Four AMS radiocarbon dates were used to date both this site and the, one of the next sites I'll be talking about, 59111. Two were sent from each site. The results confirm that both sites likely, likely date to the 17th century. However, the analysis also revealed possible earlier occupations dating to the early woodland at 5973 and the late archaic at 59111. This suggests that while most artifact classes, such as European trade goods, the Kalen pipes, the Hackney Pond indigenous pottery, and features will date to the time period of interest or the 17th century, there are some artifact categories, such as quartz flakes and other features that could be associated with these earlier occupations. So it makes it a little bit harder to parse out with the features, um, what might be related to what time period. The up Unstratified upland soil of Connecticut makes determining the age of features difficult and necessitates further radiocarbon analysis for future deposits, which I have sent off four additional um, samples and I'm awaiting the results. So hopefully I'll get some more data really soon. This finding was important because although an earlier occupation at this site 5973 was known from a handful of early archaic to early woodland projectile points, such as uh, bifurcate based stem, no diagnostic artifacts from earlier time periods have yet been found at 59111. So the radiocarbon dates helped to know that the site has been continuously occupied for a while, or at least revisited. 
Here are some of the artifacts that were found from 5973, a lot of scrap brass, some reprocessed iron, like a cut up scissor. There's the cut up hoe again, um, it's in two images. On the one on the upper right, at a later site, 59111, there was a projectile point that has the same gauge and thickness as the iron hoe, suggesting that this iron hoe might have been cut up to create this projectile point that was either used at this other site or even used in the battle itself. Uh, from the botanical analysis that has been done, it's, pop, it's looking like it might be a late spring to early fall occupation. And based on all the available evidence, this site contains uh, three to five wigwams and is believed to be a short-term seasonal site occupied during or immediately before um, the Battle of the English Withdrawal. So the next site that we had was 5991. 5991 and 59111 have been under archeological investigation since the summer of 2016. At 5991, approximately 22 square meters have been excavated uh, with, along with 62 shovel test pits. This has yielded almost a dozen features, including a shell midden and possible posts, and a diverse array of artifacts, including Kaelin pipe fragments and faunal, lithic, metallic, and glass remains. Limited botanical and faunal analyses have revealed evidence of grapes, wild plum and cherries, forest land weeds, soft clam shell, quahog, scallops, oysters, and various as yet unidentified bone and shell. And these two images, um, I'm actually gonna skip ahead to the next one. There were two distinct areas where we excavated, one on the left and one on the right. And this previous image just shows a close up of, of those excavation extents and the red squares denote where shovel test pits were located. As you can see here, though, there was a lot of metallic activity throughout the site. This cluster of uh, scrap brass could indicate some interesting things. Be a good place to dig. This site as well from the botanical data suggests that there was a spring to summer occupation here. And it is also believed to be a seasonally occupied site on, on a smaller scale than the 5973. Here is a really cool Kalen pipe with some decoration near the rim. We have a knife fragment, um, part of a jaw harp um, and some Cooper's Beads, and of course, Cooper scrap that we're seeing at all of the sites. The last site, uh, 59111, there have been a total of 52 square meters excavated here and 37 shovel test pits that have produced 22 possible features, two soapstone pipe fragments, over 100 Aboriginal pottery sherds, six blue glass trade beads, as well as small amounts of faunal and lithic remains. This site as well has two different areas of excavation. Uh, the southeastern area was first found when Brian Jones dug a test pit there. We expanded it this, or I guess it wasn't this past summer, the summer before, and we found three glass trade beads there. So Brian helped, uh, helped us find a really cool area of the site to keep going and working on. For those of you that have worked at this site, it's extremely rocky. So I just included this image to show in relation to the features where all of the rocks are located and they're everywhere. So if you didn't excavate there, be glad because it, it wasn't fun to try and scrape around all of those. Uh, the botanical analysis completed by Katie Reinhardt has identified various forest land weeds, raspberry and grape seeds, huckleberry, bayberry, greenbrier, five charred maize fragments, and one charred bean. There's also a limited amount of unidentified shell and bone fragments. And here is the blue, one of uh, the various six blue trade beads through the kid and kid typology date to between 1600 and 1625. I love the trade beads. I think I've told quite a few of you this before, but my mom came out to help me excavate 
it was two years ago and I kept talking up these trade beads like you wouldn't believe and I finally got to show her one and she went that's it and it about broke my heart but if you're in interested in archaeology, you might also think these are beautiful um, and appreciate um, how awesome it was to have found them. The distribution of metals across this site, kind of like at 5991, is quite extensive and suggests that the site may be more expansive than previously anticipated and could potentially be a large multi-acre settlement. So there's still a lot of work that you get, could be done at this site as well to figure out how big it is and what all is going on. So how do these sites fit with existing settlement patterns? Uh, 17th century Pequot settlement patterns can be inferred from archeological surveys and historical re records. Existing data suggests that settlements were multi-scalar with two Pequot fortified villages placed in strategic locations consisting of roughly 30 to 70 wigwams and supported by secondary villages of 20 to 30 wigwams, hamlets of three to five wigwams and task specific sites. All sites, regardless of size, would be expected to follow set season, set patterns of seasonality based upon historical accounts written by Euro-American traders, settlers, and explorers. Seasonality also affected mobility across the landscape, the types of communities that coalesced, and the types and sizes of settlements inhabited at any given time. Despite the variety of site types and functions that existed though, throughout the year, the household remained the basic economic unit of society and indigenous populations in the area conformed to what is believed to be a dispersed village model of settlement and so that supported the notion of family autonomy. Data thus far suggests that all sites are near interior coastal encampments or small villages that were unfortified and seasonally occupied sometime between the spring and early fall. At least two of the sites, 5973 and 5911, have shown through projectile point typologies and radiocarbon dating to have at least one earlier occupational episode, indicating that these sites have been continually occupied and exploited. One reason why these particular locations might have been chosen again in the 17th century is because they are located in between the two Pequot fortified villages that would have been occupied during the Pequot War, the forts at Mystic and Wangshunks, which you can see in this map here showing the retreat route where the um, where the two forts would have been. Uh, additionally, it is highly likely that these sites were connected along a 17th century existing Pequot Trail. The Battle of the English Withdrawal Survey found that the withdrawal route from the Mystic Fort to the English sh ships at the Thames River was intended to avoid wetlands and thus likely following an existing path that would have connected these villages or encampments. Until the discovery of the sites in the present analysis, which are located adjacent to wetlands but away from estuaries, all known prehistoric and early historic Pequot villages have been located along the estuaries of the Thames, Mystic, and Pawcatuck Rivers and along Long Island Sound, with the exception of two fortified sites, Fort Hill and Mystic Fort. These two fortified sites were anomalies as they were the only villages situated on a defensible hilltop locations and distance from estuaries and salt marshes. It's believed that these defensive settlement strategies and the increasing number of burials with embedded arrowheads, along with evidence for early wampum production seen at fortified sites, speaks to changes in the nature and intensity of native conflict during this time. Kevin McBride also believes that and posits that the introduction of European trade goods and the flourishing um, an amount of influence and power that could be garnered through the wampum trade led to intense competition among native groups. This in turn changed the dynamics of intertribal relations with groups vying for newfound power and wealth and nations seeking to subjugate neighboring communities as tributary dependents. The political, social, and economic objectives for waging war shifted during this era as an indigenous group sought to claim dominance over the region. It's also been posited that the development of trade and particularly the development of wampum trade helped to create sedentary villages and influence settlement patterns during this time period. Wampum production increasingly saw indigenous groups spending time away from seasonal occupations and rounds and instead spending the winter in sheltered upland or inland village locations. Uh, where it, oops, Indigenous coastal groups began to spend winters on the coast to gather shell and partake in wampum manufacture. Wampum and fur possess different settlement strategies with the wampum trade requiring sedentary indigenous groups and mobile European traders whereas the fur trade required fixed locations of Europeans and mobile indigenous traders. 
Trade and subsequent, subsequent conflict in the 17th century, therefore, did have an impact on the location of Pequot fortified settlements. What remains to be understood, though, is how the increased competition, trade, and warfare impacted the location of the multitude of smaller, unfortified sites and activities that in individuals were engaging in during, at these sites and during this time period. What we can see from these seasonal sites, though, is that individuals were still continuing their seasonal occupation of sites although they were shifting their settlement again away from these estuaries into more defensible locations that were uh, at a higher elevation and located adjacent, adjacent to wetlands. And wetlands were used a lot during this war and in other conflicts as a place to hide. Um, and they were hard for enemy troops to kind of tra traverse and get through. So they were useful for a variety of means. Activities appear to be focused on maintaining seasonal round occupations while also consuming trade objects and incorporating them into everyday life ways. As mentioned before, at the sites in question, reprocessing and reusing trade goods was a major activity with um, at some sites a quarter up to a half of all recovered metals being reprocessed for secondary activities. I'm very briefly gonna mention on touch upon this uh, reprocessing of metals that was occurring. And regards to these domestic sites, again, a dominant activity was related to metal use and reworking. In the period preceding sustained European interactions in North America, it has been suggested through primary sources, mortuary evidence, and archeological studies that many indigenous groups, including those in Southern New England, valued Cooper's metallic objects and used them for mainly decorative or ritual purposes. This was likely due, at least in part, to the hue of the metal and its lustrous qualities that associated it with life, vitality, and otherworldly beings. This association of material objects with a shimmering or a brilliant quality with supernatural ancestral powers is also found cross-culturally. And in this image, you can see where all the clusters of the Cooper's scrap specifically have been found, which is where we also found domestic sites. It is known from historical evidence that in the early instances of cultural contact, copper was utilized for decorative rather than functional purposes. One such example is in the letters written by the explorer Giovanni de Verrazzano. In 1524, Verrazzano sailed along the coast of North America and encountered various coastal indigenous groups. One such group was the Narragansett tribe, who are located in close proximity to the Pequots within the confines of present-day Rhode Island. Verrazano, um, as you can see from the slide, described how the Narragansett were valuing the cuprous metal over gold due to its color. Red objects like copper were believed to mediate between the light and dark forces of the cosmos and be a symbol of life, fertility, emotion, and power. Similarly, in a dialect of Algonquian, um, Ojibwa, linguistic analysis has been completed and demonstrated that the stem word of copper and also iron, glass, and mirrors can be translated as changing form. Within the wider scope of indigenous cosmology, beings that possess the power to transform and shift from one plane to another, such as amphibians, are believed to be highly powerful. Therefore, copper could also be argued to conceptually and physically represent a powerfully charged entity to native peoples based upon its ability to be easily manipulated and transformed. It's also been shown that copper has religious and medicinal qualities resulting from its um, cause associations with cosmology and its color. Bradley and Childs in their 2007 article note that copper was used for ritual healing and invoked the traditional guardian, the underwater panther, a being which held sway over the underworld and whose tail was covered by copper scales. If you were able to have a piece of copper, then you possessed a piece of this otherworldly being and had um, potentially some healing or protective properties. At the onset of European interaction and exchange, foreign items were systematically synthesized into indigenous worldviews and are found with increased frequency in a variety of hybridized manipulated forms in domestic contexts among the groups throughout North America. At the sites in question, the number and diversity of early 17th century English and Dutch trade items has been unprecedented in the archaeology of non-burial contact period sites. And the location of these items in secular domestic contexts and not hoarded by political elites for gift giving purposes or as status symbols, as has been found among groups in the Southeast and Chesapeake, 
or used exclusively in burials for ritual purposes, signals possible shifts in indigenous cosmology related to the metallic medium due to its increased access as a trade good. And here you can see how um, copper kettles were treated and frequently cut up into various secondary objects. And these are some of the secondary objects that we have found um, along the battlefield and at the domestic sites. These sites that I've been discussing are relatively rare as few village sites um, or even small domestic sites in southern New England from the late woodland into early contact period have been identified and attempts to locate such sites in the region have pr proved extremely difficult. These sites are part of a larger contact period Pequot settlement pattern of temporary and seasonal camps and small villages in the near interior coastal areas. While work and analysis is still in progress, the data generated from these studies and excavations will provide greater insight into indigenous life ways and practices during this time era. And they will also provide data critical to deciphering the effects of disrupted trade routes and intertribal and intercultural animosity on the availability of material resources and the choices individuals and communities made in response to these new realities they found themselves in. I've been talking for a long time and I hope some of you have stayed with me. I know that that was a lot. Um, I want to thank a lot of people for helping me with this work and there are more as well that aren't listed on this slide that if you're not, I just want to say thank you still. Um, I want to thank my advisor, Kevin McBride, for uh, one, finding these sites and allowing me to excavate at them um, and for all of his support throughout this project. I want to thank my dissertation committee who has been involved in the process and has helped in various ways, including uh, Brian Jones, who was originally on my committee and helped find an area where all those trade goods were. Um, additionally, the Mashantucka Pequot Museum, all of the Yukon Battlefield School participants, and um, metal detectors that have helped with this study and the many, many people that have helped me dig. Um, I appreciate you and I thank you and to um, these entities, including FOSA and ASC for helping fund this research. All right, that's gonna be it for me. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna click on the Q&A to see the questions. Okay, so I'll start at the top. So Marissa asked, my question is, oh, hello? Dave, is that you? No. Okay, I'm just gonna keep going then. Uh, what do you think the future research into the topic should include? That is a great question. Um, I think because for a long time, there was even a symposium that they didn't, they had no idea where village sites or dom some domestic sites were during this time period. I think doing, if it's possible, you know, with timing and funding, uh, sometimes doing additional surveys is impossible, but um, exploring more areas using these combined approaches of traditional archaeological surveying with metal detecting might be able to uncover more sites and uh, give us more answers and lead us to even ask more questions that we're not aware of right now. I hope that answered your question. Uh, Clifford had two questions. Are you the person who is using the pink embellished eye flags in the field? And two, is there a marker in the field that relates to the smallpox epidemic? Um, so your first question, not me personally, but one of our Jedi masters, that is his signature flag. Um, whenever we find an artifact in the field, we GPS it and then collect it. But those are left in place so that if we need to pull it into a larger grid system, uh, we can do that. Because in the field, things get hectic really quickly, especially when you have 10 field school students that are also running around. Um, so you're just taking GPS points and need to come back to, to those areas later. Is there a marker in the field related to the smallpox epidemic? Um, I don't completely know what you mean by that one. Um, there, in regards to at the domestic sites, there isn't any 
direct evidence of the smallpox epidemic. So we don't have any markers for that. Um, so I'm not sure if I answered that question, but those are both great ones. Is there any way to determine if the villages were occupied before, during, or after the action of the mystic retreat? Great question. Um, the only one that we think might have been occupied was 5973 because of the direction of fire and because there were burn features there, we think that there were standing structures. Um, the botanical data suggests that it might have also been occupied in the spring, although it, it varies and goes into later as well. So that is the only one that we think at this moment might have been occupied, aside from the forts, which um, those were definitely occupied during that time period. Bill said, yeah, it is cool um, that we found some prehistoric artifacts. So they do correlate with those AMS states, yep. Peter asked, I'd be cautious with 5973 drawing, that it's exclusively dead rains from the river. Yes, Peter, I would love to talk to you more. Um, it is possible that some of the metals that we're assuming are associated with the battle could have been dropped later as well. Um, but yes, I would love to hear more about that site. Um, I'll have to try and send you an email, or if you could send me an email, that would be great. It's my name, megan.willison at uconn.edu. Henry. Yes, there has been ooh, no forks, but there is at least one spoon that has been found. And I'm blanking off there's more than one spoon. I know there's definitely at least one spoon though that we have found. Great question. Do there have been any digs in New London? Um, so these sites are located in the Groton Mystic area. Um, outside of that, there might have been additional digs done elsewhere. There's always uh, companies and researchers doing stuff. Um, but I've mainly been focused on those three that I was talking about today. But there are, there's definitely a possibility and it's very likely that there are digs happening um, elsewhere outside of the ones I talked about today. Neil, have the musk ball calibers been measured? Yes, all of them have been measured. Um, I don't have that data in front of me right now, but if you wanna send me an email, I'd be happy to talk about the calibers and their distribution if that would be of interest to you. How can one get involved in field work? That is a great question. I know um, FOSA specifically has field work over the summer. If you're not a FOSA member, um, you can sign up and get involved that way. And if you're interested specifically in the battlefield project, um, I'm unfortunately, although I'm still researching it, I have moved across the country to Utah, so I'm not able to get out there and help out with field work. But my advisor, uh, Kevin McBride at the University of Connecticut is still actively doing field work. So if, um, if you really want to learn more about metal detecting or maybe be involved in some of these studies, I recommend reaching out to him. And his email can be found on the Yukon Anthropology webpage. Or if you wanna email me, I can get you in contact as well. Sean, what is next for the future on the work, in the work on these sites? That is a great question. Um, I know my advisor, Kevin, is still doing some work at 5973. I've gotten some uh, fun texts from him and emails this fall that he was out at 15, that he was out at that site metal detecting and finding even more concentrations. Um, in regards to at 111 and 91, uh, I don't know. I hope that work could and would continue if there is interest from researchers, either upcoming graduate students or from Kevin and other people that he knows to continue work at these sites. Um, but at the moment, my excavations at them have ended. Um, hopefully though, at some point I'll get to return to Connecticut. And if there's the ability to keep working on them, I would love to keep exploring. There are so many areas that could still be um, investigated. What has been the interest and what concerns have been raised about investigating and metal detecting on these ancestral sites by contemporary Pequot people? That is a great question. Uh, so work, uh, 
was done in coordination, uh, especially up until like 2019 with the Mashantucka Pequot Museum and Research Center. And so the tribe was actively involved with, along with Kevin, they were, um, the tribe through the museum was awarded the grants to study these sites. And they have hosted a battlefield conference at the museum. Um, they have exhibits related to the results from this research and they house the vast majority of the objects that have been recovered from this study. So um, I don't know entirely what all concerns have been raised as I haven't been a part of that dialogue, but I know that they, the tribes through the museum and the um, upper levels, I guess, at the museum have been involved in this research pretty actively. Tyler, um, what, thank you. What plans for preser preservation of these sites exist or are in the works? Um, as of right now, there are no that I am aware of um, long-term preservation plans in place, but that is something that I hope I could help work with, put into place. Um, and the results that have been found from the battlefield study and some of this study will hopefully be displayed or some of it is already displayed in the Pequot Museum. So there is some educational component that is, uh, that is happening. Do you need future volunteers in the field or the laboratory? I would love to volunteer. Yeah. Um, again, I, I would contact, if you're just interested in general archaeology volunteering, I highly recommend that you contact FOSA. I, I don't know with COVID if they've been maintaining their laboratory hours, but usually uh, during the semester at least, they were meeting once a week to help out with excavations associated with the Office of the State Archaeology the FOSA was helping out with. Um, in regards to this specific study, again, I'm, I'm sadly not in Connecticut right now to help out. I love volunteers though. I was always looking for them. Uh, when I was there. But if you're interested in this battlefield project, either shoot me an email or I would recommend reaching out to Kevin and seeing if there was some way you could help out. Um, I know I was always looking for volunteers, so I'm sure any help you could provide would be appreciated. I know that you focus on the battle aspect of the sites. Um, Sandy is curious about the clothing artifacts found at the sites. What are they and what is the quality of the items. Um, clothing items. We haven't found any buttons. There have been, um, there actually really haven't been that many clothing items that I'm thinking of, specific clothing items. A lot of the items are a little bit more decorative, like beads or um, tinkling cones. Um, there might have been a clasp. There has been some like European armor pieces that have been found but not a whole lot specifically related to clothing. The quality of them, uh, the cuprous items we find are across the board normally in pretty good condition. The ferrous ones, the iron ones, they're normally pretty degraded. So they have to go through a, a process of being x-rayed to see what their actual outline looks like. And then they're hit with an aerobrader and then coated in a tannic acid. So initially looking at it, a lot of them are super crusty and it can be hard to tell what they are at first glance. I hope that answered your question. Uh, Neil, yes to calibers. Okay, I am gonna copy your email address and we'll be in touch soon. Were there any other questions? No. Oh, not really. Hi, Scott. Yeah, so I work at Dinosaur National Monument as the park archaeologist. Um, I get asked all the time about the fossils that I'm excavating. Although there is a bone wall, and I will be helping out the park paleontologist this summer excavate some dinosaurs. Uh, that's not a regular part of my job, although I do find it really cool. And there are a number of arc sites here that have fossils and cultural context, which I think is really interesting. Um, but yeah, my work, I do a lot of uh, monitoring like this morning. So I'm decided to dig a trench 
or to clean out a culvert and a drainage area. So I was monitoring that to make sure that they didn't plow through a pit house, which they didn't. It was good. Um, a lot of my work too is with compliance. So because it's on federal land before any work happens, uh, projects have to go through uh, section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act compliance, which means I have to assess the impacts and effects that the project is gonna have on our historic and cultural resources. So that involves uh, looking at the project, going through a lot of historical documents, consulting with state agencies and our 36 uh, federally recognized tribes that we're associated with. Um, I'm also involved in really anything related to archaeology at the park, I'm hoping to jumpstart a monitoring program soon um, with our law enforcement to help go out at sites and visit them regularly, um, oversee any research permits that have to do with archaeology or digging. Uh, every day is a little bit different. Um, so I enjoyed it a lot. I hope that answered your question. And if anyone's ever in the area, love to show you around. Uh, Amanda, do you know if anything the town of Groton is doing to prevent disturbance to these and other potential sites was posted in chat? Um, the town of Groton, no. Um, I don't believe there isn't, there currently isn't anything that they are actively doing to prevent the disturbance to these sites. Um, a lot of those conversations though have been happening at the level above me. Uh, my advisor has been the one getting the permits and coordinating with different landowners and agencies to be able to do this work. So there might be other conversations that have been had that I'm not fully aware of. But as of right now, uh, aside from when I was out there going out there pretty regularly to excavate at the sites and check up on them, there wasn't any type of active uh, plan in place for them. Clifford, how's it come? How's my doctor coming along? It's coming. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's coming. I'm spending my evenings and weekends trying to work on uh, my dissertation writing, but I'm enjoying it. It's been fun. I'm hoping I'm in the final stretch and it'll be not over soon, but that chapter will end and I can uh, focus on the next chapter. What are your publication plans for this site? Book, children's book? I would love to make a children's book. I'm super bad at drawing now, so I would need a lot of collaboration. But yes, a children's book would be wonderful. Um, if that doesn't end up materializing though, I'm hoping to publish my dissertation in the format of probably a couple journal articles and doing more presentations on the site. Are these findings written up somewhere? Um, that's a great question. There have been findings related to the archaeology of the battlefield and the work that Kevin McBride has done on the retreat route. Um, not necessarily published in a book, but they have been published in a report um, that's been sent to the American Battlefield Protection Program. So there is some type of written component that uh, that might be able to be shared. Um, in regards to this work, uh, Bill Farley has written his dissertation about Site 5973, so you can check out his dissertation to read more about that specific site. Um, he also has an upcoming journal article that talks a little bit more about this methodology at some of these sites, but overall this whole presentation hasn't been written up formally, if, if that makes sense, but hopefully in my dissertation it will be. Have I been planning on doing any publication? Yes, I do. Um, hopefully once a dissertation is written, it'll be written in the format of a couple journal articles and then those can get sent out for review and publication. Photos. I would love to collaborate on something like that. Sure. Yeah. It, I would love to do a children's book. So if you're interested in that, uh, send me an email and we can make that work. Or we can try. I don't know who would like it, but I'd send it to all my friends to see if they'd read it. Okay. Well, thank you, Megan, for that fantastic presentation. Uh, I hope you will all join us next week when Dan Zoto will be presenting on narrow stems 
uh, and a view from the Laurel Beach site in Milford, where he's going to be talking about narrow stems and the woodland period. But thanks again, Megan. It was a great presentation to kick off our winter series. And we'll be here uh, for the next couple of weeks on Wednesday at 7 p.m. So please check the OSA or FOSA uh, Facebook pages or the ASC website to see links for the um, Zooms. And we will see you all next week. Thanks again. Great. Thank you all. Have a good night.